Welcome ladies and gents to the Master of Industry Run episode 2. Hope you're all doing well and enjoyed the previous episode. If you haven't seen it, click the card in the top right to get caught up. Okay, first thing on the agenda today is to deal with the estates. If you don't keep them on side, you can expect to encounter a few problems. If loyalty falls below 30%, it might go a bit pear-shaped for you. There are a few bits and pieces to go through here. First of all is the sale of titles, selling off 10% of the crown land for a nice big sack of cash. Selling off crown land is a good way to build loyalty, but problems will arise if you favour an estate too heavily. Summon the council for some free loyalty and then choose an available task from the list. If you need to claim back some land, there's always the option to seize it from the estates. Not something you want to do very often, but it's handy if you need to organise the empire. Looking at the estates individually, you've got the clergy focused on tax and the spread of religion. The merchants, as you would expect, are concerned with global trade power efficiency and steering. The nobility are focused around the army and national manpower. And the common folk apply positive buffs to production efficiency, national unrest and the cost of development. In this run I'll be favouring the merchants, but it will be important to keep a good balance to begin with. Giving up land at this point wouldn't really be advantageous, and with that in mind there aren't many options to choose from. Free enterprise is a good start to get the merchants on side. Okay, let's summon the council to see the available tasks. Merchants want to increase the size of the navy, the mobility wants to increase the size of the army, and the common folk want to increase wealth in Frost Fort. The request of the common folk will probably be the easiest to do, so we'll go for that one. We've got a bit of money in the bank, it's always nice to have some spare cash so we can look at making improvements. Boosting the base manpower would be useful, Barracks and World's End would boost it by 687. It's not a massive amount currently, but the modifier of 25% is strong moving forward. Looking at the admin power, it's possible we can complete the agenda of the common folk. 97 admin power to raise the base tax level, uh, 194 in total to complete the task. Only gets us 10 loyalty and prestige, but it's better than nothing. Religious power is high enough to apply a new perk, so an increase in army discipline seems like a good idea. We will begin to build the army in the near future, so it's a good perk to have. I'm going to fast forward now through the improvements I'm making to the provinces, partly because of the repetitive nature of it and it's not the most thrilling thing to watch, but also because there's a lot of them to make early on. Building a solid economic base is time consuming, but it's essential for the strat to work. I won't be leaving anything out because you might want to replicate this strategy yourself, but it's probably best to press on through a bit. Further down the line I'll look at the situation again and recap. Alright, so the Night King's apparently a babbling buffoon. In terms of the gameplay, it's a bit redundant as the others can't conduct diplomacy anyway, but it's an interesting mental picture. I love the fact that the Night King, fearless warrior and leader, has essentially become an idiot chili farmer of the frozen wastes. I'm trying to build up the provinces in an even fashion, and the reason for that is because if we were to lose any of the provinces at any point, building evenly would lessen the financial impact a little bit. We can boost production in Frostfort by 25%, more chilies for all, and we can set the final religious enchantment. The enchantment of power gives us 10% extra shock damage in battles, so can't really say no to that. Now that all the enchantments are in place, we need to have a look at the technology screen. It has been a bit neglected, tons of points have been spent to build up the empire, so it's time to shift the focus a little bit to the accumulation of monarch points. I'm going to set the national focus to diplomatic points so I can continue boosting production, but I'm going to offset that by installing an advisor and administration. It does cost a bit of money to do, and there is a monthly cost, but it does accrue an extra admin point every month, which is worth it, especially if you are behind in tech. Okay, more boost into the chili plantations and more money in trade. The only problem with going all in on the chili production is if the market price crashes, then the economy might tank a little bit. There's something I should have done a little bit earlier to help out the money situation, but it does have its drawbacks. Decreasing the army maintenance gets me a little more gold per month. The army will be underfunded and would get slaughtered in a battle, but it makes sense to do it now rather than later when threats start arising. It's time to start investing in technology now, and from a defensive standpoint it makes sense to start boosting the military tech level. It doesn't really matter if we're a couple levels behind our neighbours, we do need to try and stay in touch. As time goes on, we're going to have a lot of enemies, so we need to be able to compete. So have a quick look at the world, and see how the other houses are getting on. The clans north of the wall are starting to spread out a bit, and there will be some alliances to look at. I'm probably going to need at least 50k in men before I declare war on anyone. Looking south of the wall, I think it'd be wise to keep an eye on the Talarts and Karstarks in particular. 
As far as I know, the alliance between the Night's Watch and the Starks is still intact. I expect further wars in the near future. Alright, time to increase the trade power a little bit by making some trading ships. We'll start building ships in every coastal province and add them to the main fleet when they're done. Naval force limit currently sits at 17, so I can make a few more before hitting the cap. Time to add 500 troops to the manpower reserves and a trip to the estate screen once again. Sailor titles wouldn't generate that much revenue, so we can hold off on that. Let's summon the council again, see what we can do. The proposal of the common folk fits quite nicely. One more level of improvement should satisfy the condition. We want the merchants to have more privileges, so the land of commerce perk seems like a good idea. An extra diplo point per month is a nice addition, and we can ramp up production and tech a bit faster. Positive modifiers are starting to stack up quite nicely. Alright, so, the new merchant ships are ready, and we can add them to the main fleet. It's not too far away from home, so we can collect all of the ships together and send them off to protect the trade node. We want to have majority control of the trade node beyond the wall, and when the time comes we can steer trade towards Winterfell. At some point I'll be mixing in some heavier ships with more firepower to the fleet. Trade ships on their own would be sitting ducks to a rounded naval threat. There's still time, uh, no real pressure at this point, but it's something to be aware of. The economy is looking pretty healthy, just under four and a half ducats a month. Tax is the biggest contributor currently, and I expect that to change pretty soon. High tax revenue is always a good thing, but it's not the main focus for this run. Alright, so we've got enough points to increase the admin tech level, so we can go ahead with that. We'll get access to the first idea group at level 5, so it makes sense to try and rush to that. I'm currently thinking of perks focused on the military, uh, possibly in the manpower department. We could overwhelm the enemy with weaker troops in greater numbers. I guess that would depend on the quality of the general leading the army. We can make more improvements to the provinces, so I'll go ahead and make those. I will split the video into chapters to make it easier to skip between sections. This series is now my main focus, so videos should be out regularly from this point onwards. Okay, so my advisor for administration appears to have died. And there's only one suitable candidate to replace him with here. A 10% boost in production efficiency is quite nice. Compliments the main focus of the run. The bank's looking quite healthy at the moment, so we can look to add a few new buildings to the provinces. Mines increase the local production efficiency, so it does make sense to have one deployed in every province. Very cheap at 95 ducats each for a 25% increase. Gradual increases made over time to the development will allow more buildings. It's about achieving a healthy balance between development and tech level. If we take a quick look at the mission tree, one of the missions is to build mines and farms in each of the starting provinces, so we can work towards completing that. Brilliant news, second advisor has just departed. Kind of a shame really, because the production efficiency modifier was good, but uh, at least this new guy can come with a reduction in cost. The development cost reduction of the second candidate is nice, but advisors are dropping like flies at the moment, I'm not sure we can make full use of it. Okay, so the mountain clans are starting to spread themselves out, so we need to see who's allied with each other. Grimmie are currently allied with House Mormont and Dorkaran, thanks to the tributaries to the Thents, and allied with Abayet. I bet. No doubt I've ruined the pronunciation of that one, feel free to leave a note in the comments about how to do it properly. Moving back home for a second, we can deploy a farm in Nightstone to boost the local tax modifier. It all goes towards the completion of the mission, so might as well get it done. Time for another round of shipbuilding, still making trade ships for now, but with plans to colonise down the coast beyond Icewind Vale. We will need more sailors and ports, so it makes sense to try and stop Grimmie from expanding northwards. If we can take full control of the western coast, it'll put us in a strong position. One quick boost to manpower, always happy to get more recruits. Alright, it's getting a bit spicy south of the wall, northern houses dragging each other into walls all over the shop. The Night's Watch are looking in some serious trouble after making some gains early on. They're going to need some help from the Starks to try and take back the land that they've lost. Uh, they've been a bit too aggressive and overextended a bit. Having said that though, the Starks have their own troubles with House Reed, we'll have to see how this one pans out. 
We're going for the World Conquest, so we'll end up fighting everyone at some point anyway, but it'll be interesting to see who prevails. Nothing much happening south of the Twins, although King's Landing is occupied by House Bollingford. Full disclosure, didn't even know they were a house. I'll end the video here for today. Join us again next time when I'll start to build a mighty army and take control of the land beyond the wall. Don't forget to subscribe to keep track of future content, I really appreciate your support, and I'll see you in the next one.